So my name is Daniel Rosa. Uh, I work at Bloomberg. Uh, we started about a year ago a new team uh, that is static analysis and automated refactoring. Uh, and I, I guess I should start with like why we're doing this. Uh, and like it, it's not that surprising. Like, Bloomberg is a company with like 30 plus years uh, code mixed, like, several generations of developers. Uh, there's a substantial amount of code reuse across different units of the organization. Uh, code that ends up linked in the same executables. Uh, I think it, it's a quite common place for companies this size to have like four gigabyte executables uh, running around. Uh, Bloomberg is not an exception. Um, the good news though is it is all continuously integrated and deployed, so that gives us some confidence that we can make the changes uh, on the code uh, and, and have that code integrated and deployed. And it's not gonna be like a change that we introduced by a tool and that, that code just doesn't work and we don't find out for uh, a long time. Um, so the space of writing language tools is, is not new. There is a, a, a long history. Um, but I want to focus specifically on like C, C++ uh, because these are languages that are complex enough that it's really hard to create a tool that has the same semantics that the compiler will get. So if you want to write a tool that, that processes C and C++ language, you, you kind of have to use the compiler because modeling the entire semantics of the language by yourself is kind of a daunting task. Uh, so for a long time, what we had was GCC. Uh, I'm not gonna enter too much on the details of like what the problems were with GCC. There, like, there were also some political issues related to the enforcement of the GPL and, uh, and that drove some of the technical decisions on how GCC was designed, kind of making it purposefully harder to write independent tools from the compiler. Uh, again, I'm not gonna make a value judgment on that. Uh, but the fact is, the barrier to entry to writing a tool inside the GCC was quite large. So even, even at Bloomberg, we, we only would do that like once or twice because it would only be for problems that were like really, really systematic problems where it would make sense investing all that time. Um, then LVM came around and around the time of LVM 3, uh, more specifically, uh, and I'm gonna uh, mark as 3.8 because a number of tools are still like on that, on that version of LVM. Uh, suddenly it was easier to write tools that can parse the C and C++ code with all the semantic knowledge that the compiler has. Uh, there's like significant architectural differences between Clang, LVM, and how GCC works that makes the whole analysis process much easier. Uh, however, at the time, uh, the API surrounding uh, code analysis, uh, abstract syntax tree, uh, the way that you interact with those were, were still very much in flux. Uh, and I think it's, it's a good measure of that, that there is still like a very large number of tools that haven't managed to port away from 3.8 because the, the amount of changes that happened around that age made a lot, like made the maintenance of those API changes super hard. Clang tooling, on the other hand, kind of represented like a new paradigm on how you write tools. Uh, a, a very simple way to think about that is that before that, you, you had to build your tool inside the Clang code base. There was no way for you to like build your tool like as a separate unit from from the compiler itself, and with Clang tooling, like building it externally became became quite easy. Uh, and in that sense, at Bloomberg, we we have started working with Clang four and have successfully migrated from four to five, from five to six, from six to seven. Uh, and the amount of breakages that happened has reduced a lot, and the fact that it's now uh, in a much more well-defined interface with the rest of the system uh, makes those changes less likely to cause problems. So, and because this talk is a little bit about like sharing the lessons learned on writing tools, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, 
uh, how I started like a year ago when Bloomberg formed this new team uh, to perform like writing robots that rewrite code. Uh, so the first thing I did was like the exercise, which was to like re-implement include what you use. Uh, if you don't know what that is, that's a tool that rewrites your header inclusions to make sure that you're not relying on transitive includes and that you're not including things that you don't use. Um, I cheated a lot, basically. Uh, I didn't understand how the life cycle worked, so I just said like, yeah, let's just use globals. Uh, I didn't quite know at which point of the run of the tool between all the million callbacks when to actually do the rewrites. So I just did the rewrite whenever I found like uh, something, so a header that was not included that should be included. I would just like, oh, let me just add the rewrite now. So many stub oxygen docs. That, that is probably like the, the biggest drag on like getting to know Clang is that you, you just have to like, you go look at Doxygen and then you start clicking on the like referenced by and you start looking like how other parts of LVM and Clang use that function so you understand what the function does. Uh, this is actually something that like now that my team is maturing is something that we, we will be like spending some time and making sure that we push some docs back into the, into the here docs. Callbacks, writing like, like we had a strong like functional background. Uh, we are also parsing Fortune using Haskell. So like callbacks by themselves is not necessarily a problem, but writing callbacks, callback based programming in C++ is not really the best. And, and the, the one that like confused me absolutely was like, I just did not understand how long I could keep the pointers I got for. Like I would get a pointer from the, the, some API and that was in a callback and it was like, how, how long can I keep this? Like, I don't know. Uh, turns out you can keep it forever, but like it, it was not clear. But I did have some interesting lessons there. The first is that writing Flink is actually not that hard. Uh, once you get through like the barrier of having to read some of the code to know what the functions do, you end up with like a very confident tool that you you get pretty happy with it. It actually works. I, I actually had like a functioning re-implementation of include what you use. But there was not a single line of reusable code there. It was just, there's, there was not a single file there that, that could be taken out of the tool and reused somewhere else. And tightly coupling, like the analysis was mixed with the rewriting, which was mixed with the data collection. Uh, Needless to say, that's not good. And at that time, we came with like a few principles that have guided how we're working with implementing claim tools. We're also applying that to our Has Haskell uh, framework that we're using to like analyze and rewrite Fortran. The first is that a refactoring tool should make the smallest change possible. Uh, that means that, for instance, whenever I change a file, I'm not redumping the AST. What I'm doing is I'm finding the specific statement, the specific expression that I have to change, and I grab the source range for that particular expression, and I add a, a string replacement of what needs to be changed. That's important because when you think about the workflow surrounding this, as confident as you may be about your tool, you still want a human to review it before it gets checked in and it's gonna be super hard to check in if you're introducing a bunch of white space changes or reformatting at the same time. So we want to make sure that every single tool only performs like surgically the smallest possible change. The other is we're not gonna try to build like a tool that takes like complicated configurations on what kinds of changes to make. Essentially, the, you're gonna write the tool, run it, throw it away. So the goal is we need to make uh, the amount of code that is specific to the logic that you're doing like as short as possible, such that the cost of throwing that tool away uh, doesn't get in the way of you just saying like, you know what, I see this particular like syntactic construct in our code base. Uh, we can replace this by a more modern version of that. 
or we can replace the usage of this API by the usage of this API. Uh, and if we, if we feel that we can write those tools without losing a lot of time, like re-implementing infrastructure, we don't need like a, a complicated or a powerful configuration system that allows you to make different matching and changes. We just write a tool that does a change, run it, throw it away. And in term, to, to allow that, we came up with like these three basic design patterns. The design of having a phase for collection, a phase for analyzing, and a phase for rewriting. And you strictly separate those. So what, what do I mean by data collector? So when you're writing a claim tool, you need to register like post uh, preprocessor uh, hooks. You need to like add match finders to the, the compiler instance. And, and if you try to perform the analysis during those callbacks, it's gonna be hard to make the code reusable. So what the, call, the, the data collector does is it registers all the callbacks that it needs and it just stores all the data that it collects as a member of the class. It doesn't perform any particular analysis and it just exposes the data in a useful way. So you create like a, a data structure that represents the abstract data that you're collecting. Not necessarily like matching the abstract syntax tree, sometimes it's gonna be a map that you say like, oh, the, this fun a function of this name is called on these places. And then the analysis is defined by having like a single entry point, so no callbacks. It's gonna be like straightforward, like imperative code, where you're gonna call a function with some data and it's gonna return some data. And in the end, the goal is that your tool should have as little tool-specific code as possible. So all this infrastructure in terms of what data you need to perform your analysis, particular analysis logic that you're gonna perform, they should be moved away into like reusable uh, components. And then your, the tool that makes the specific logic for the syntax that you wanna change is gonna be very short in that particular tool. That is the code that you're gonna throw away in the end. And then finally, refactoring, uh, which thankfully we don't have to do anything for because uh, clean tooling already supports refactoring nat natively. All you have to do is fill in the replacements map. Uh, and a surprising thing when you're, before the refactoring tool was part of the API, uh, you had to do the rewrites yourself. And it was always like, you were always unsure, like, am I making this coherently? Because if you're making a bunch of changes, am I making changes that are gonna overlap with each other? Am I gonna make changes that are gonna like cause an offset on the other change? Uh, and the, the rewrite support, the replacement support in refactoring tool just handles that for you. Like if you try to make an overlapping change, it's just gonna fail. So the way that we implemented this was a thing that we called Kling Meta Tool. And it basically addresses three, three main problems. It handles the lifecycle management of the tool. The data collect, it offers a bunch of reusable data collectors and offers like reusable analysis components. So this, this code is essentially like the code that you'll find when, when you go through a tutorial on how to write a Clang tool. Uh, I don't know if you can see the numbers, but like number nine, line nine, this line right, oops, sorry. Um, this line right here is, is the line where you actually say like, this is the code that I'm gonna run. The problem, like when you're writing that the first time, is that the refactoring tool does not expect an object, or rather it does not expect an object that is the tool. It expects an object that is a factory that will create the tool object for each inst compiler instance run. And that's where like, you start getting confused with life, life cycle management because the solution that you're gonna see in the tutorial is gonna be like, oh, just put your tool object in, uh, in a global and then have your refactoring tool uh, re, uh, your tool factory just returned that object, uh, which 
again, it's not going to be super good for code reuse. So the thing that we introduce here is the meta tool factory and the meta tool. So the meta tool factory is just an implementation of the meta tool factory that invokes meta tool. Meta tool is a simple set of hooks that will connect with like the expected callbacks and offer you a much simpler interface. So now all you have to do is write a class that has a constructor that takes the compiler instance and the match finder. You have some data collectors and you initialize those data collectors with the compiler instance and the match finder. The life cycle of those objects is the life cycle of your tool object and all the data that you collect will live just as long as your tool object lives. And, and that's pretty much all you have to do in the constructor because the collectors themselves are going and have registering themselves as callbacks, collecting the data and storing that data into this object that is in life cycle of the tool. And then there is a single entry point, which is like a straightforward imperative phase where it just has like a post processing where you take, the, you take as parameters like the replacement map. At this point, you can take the data from the collectors, do whatever analysis you want to do, and either give like a warning if you find something that you don't like, uh, or just add replacements to the replacement map. The reusable data collector is, is again, it's a design pattern. So I'm, I'm using a specific example. We have a few, uh, a few collectors in, in the repository. In this particular case, it's a collector where you say, I want to find all uses or all declarations of a function of a given name. So you're, like in this case, I'm saying, I want to find all calls to legacy function. And again, my constructor ends up empty besides initialization. And the post-processing phase is where I'm gonna do what I need. And the collector just offers you like a data structure, which is find calls data. And find calls data has uh, a map. Uh, or is it an array? One of the two. Uh, that where you can just iterate and do something for each call to legacy function. Uh, so far so good, but th this much you could do just with the code search. Right? The, the important point comes when you have things like this. Uh, imagine that you have a configuration system in your code base that takes a configuration key as a parameter, and that parameter is a, is a C string. Uh, now imagine that your developers are not very diligent in marking constants as const, and imagine that, that the variable may be reused for different keys across the code. And you have like set variable to this value call function, set value to this variable call function. Uh, so if you try to use constant folding in Clang, Clang is gonna say like, sorry, this is not a const. But we can use the control flow graph that Clang offers and essentially walk back in the code and find, is there a, a deterministic value for this variable at this point? And what is it? And then at this point, we can say like, oh, you're calling the, the legacy configuration system with this key. And now we can go and say like, oh, this entire expression, because we know that this legacy system is, is gone and frozen in the database, we can just replace that by the static return that we would, would, go, would be returned from the database anyway. And then we can just like surgically replace the expression with the constant value. Uh, so in terms of the impact that this had at Bloomberg, uh, I think the most important one is like the low cost of writing new tools. Like currently, if we, ha if we have some particular thing that we're interested in, like in less than a week, we have a tool, we run it in the code, we get the replacements and, and we're done. Uh, and we can move on to the, the, the next thing. Uh, it also means that we can do like custom static analysis for, uh, for things that wouldn't be appropriate to be as a generic Clang static analyzer uh, feature because maybe it's something that depends on knowledge of what this particular function does. So if we have a function that has a particular behavior and we have a call to another function that has a different particular behavior, 
and we know that the data flow from one function to the other uh, happens in a particular way, we can make decisions that uh, a generic analyzer wouldn't be in a position to do. And, and doing that is gonna be like a weak project, and, and then we have it. And uh, that also means that we are slowly ramping up the, the amount of uh, automatic rewriting that we do in the code base. So essentially we're gonna get to the point where if we identify, let's say that this class is deprecated and you need to replace by this class, but then the methods that you call have to be slightly different or the parameters have to be prepared in a different way, we will be in a position to just automatically rewrite that code. Um, and I think that's it. I was super on time, I guess. Any questions? Hey there. Um, so um, I work with uh, a lot of similar stuff uh, at, at Google, um, and the the biggest pain point for me whenever I'm writing a, a client-based tool is really like getting the exact like writing the matcher, like 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 fussing around, you know, with uh, and and getting the matcher. Is there this Clang Meta tool? It looks like it, it comes with like sort of like a collection of functionality that has a lot of like like built-in matchers ready to go. Yeah, that that that's essentially the 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 first part of the the tool is is a bunch of like pre-made matchers. So like if you want to find references to a variable, like we you don't have to like read to think what the matcher expression needs to be. So the goal of the tool is precisely like construct a bunch of reusable like matching that will give us ready-made data structures that we that we can uh, imperatively work on instead of having to like reassemble that from callbacks again on every tool. Um, so yeah, that, that's essentially like the, the main purpose of the tool is making sure that we can reuse those matching expressions and we don't have to figure out what the correct set of matching expressions is for a particular use case over and over again. Awesome, and, and I missed the beginning. Is, is this like, like uh, this is, oh, it's right there, available, okay. Yeah. Hi, David Tardity from Microsoft, nice talk. Um, quick question, since I've never looked at this, how are you tracking the version of Clang? Like, is your tool dependent on the version of Clang? How dependent is it? So we, um, right now, the GitHub repo has Travis set up for Clang 6 and Clang 7. Uh, we migrated away from Clang 5 uh, a little bit back. Uh, I don't think there was anything that we had to change between Clang 5 and Clang 6. Uh, so I'm like moderately confident that it works in Clang 5. Okay, so you're tracking recent versions of Clang, basically. Are there API changes that are happening that affect, affect the consumers in your tools? Like, how much work is it for me to keep up with Clang as it changes? So, and, and, and again, that, that is precisely the point, is like being able to abstract those things away from like the people writing the individual tools. So if we have a tool, a, a data collector that is in uh, Clang Meta tool, then that data collector will have its test suite and we're gonna run the test suite against like the different versions of Clang and then your code is not exposed to those, uh, to that churn. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, so I had a, a also a more specific question about some of the example code you showed um, where you used std map. Um, in the post processing, is is that just slideware? Or is there a, a reason that we that you need the ordering constraint there? Uh, that I think is the type that Kling itself uses. I'm pretty sure. Uh, not entirely sure. Cool. Uh, but I, I don't think. Let me put it this way. I don't think we're going to be changing that many files in a single tool run where this would ever be a problem. Understandable. Anyone else? Great. Well, let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you.